Thank you all for coming out this morning. Um, my name is Darren Glass. I'm the alumni professor of mathematics here at Gettysburg College, as well as the director of the first year seminar program. Uh, today we have three of our wonderful colleagues, three of my wonderful colleagues here to talk about on a panel about economics, politics, and citizenship in the Trump years. I would like to say that I'm here as a mathematician because of the broad, deep, interdisciplinary nature of the whole topic. The reality is that I have lunch with Bruce and Char, and the other day they realized they didn't have a moderator, so they asked me if I could come. Um, that said, I'm still very excited to be here and listen uh, to what these, these three of my colleagues have to say. Um, we will begin today with uh, Charles Weiss, the professor of economics and chair of the public policy program. Uh, then Jennifer Gaffney, professor of philosophy, will speak. And finally, Bruce Larson, professor of political science and chair of the political science department, will wrap things up. And then hopefully we'll have some good time for questions from all of you. Uh, so let's begin with Professor Weiss. Thank you. Thanks everybody, for, thanks everybody for being here. I don't know, is that gonna work? All right. Uh, so I guess uh, I'm Char Weiss in the economics and public policy program. Um, I uh, see as my job here to show some data and make a couple of provocative points uh, related to sort of the, the economic uh, structural. I could do that. So uh, I, I will um, talk a little bit about the economics, uh, structural economic foundation for what we're experiencing in the United States in terms of the, the Trump phenomenon, uh, and maybe with a little bit, not too much about the uh, Brexit and populism in, in Europe, but uh, sort of reflections on how did we get to this sort of populist moment. Um, and so, wait, how do I, I want to show you how to work that? I thought I had it down. Yeah. Oh, this way. Here we go. Yep. There we go. You're going to edit the film, right? <laughs> so probably a lot of you are, are, are familiar with what I think is the, um, the most serious economic. Actually, let, let, me, let me actually uh, start with a, a sort of a vignette. And this is what got me thinking about this topic. Uh, I read in the newspaper about the origins, uh, sort of a biography of Donald Trump, um, and, it, and it, uh, it, it noted that his father, Fred Trump, had made his fortune uh, uh, building housing for the middle class in Queens, New York, and Brooklyn, and places like that. And, uh, and, and in contrast, uh, Donald Trump made his fortune in luxury housing in Manhattan, and I thought, what a world it once was where there was money to be made building houses for the middle class, where the middle class was a source of demand for goods and services. And I, I thought about this for a long time, and um, immediately data popped to my head, sort of verifying this, this structural problem that, uh, that the, the uh, lower income classes have really separated, been separated from the upper income classes in the last half century or so. So here's one example. Um, gross domestic product per capita, per person GDP, uh, shown in red, has been rising at historically normal rates, 3% per year, uh, well, per capita GDP, 1%, 1.5% uh, per year, uh, since 1955. No, no real big change there. Up until about 1975 or so, median income, the incomes of the typical family, kept pace with that average, uh, indicating that the the benefits of growth were sort of bro broadly spread across the income distribution. And since the mid-1970s, that line has sort of flattened out. And now we have a, s a real stark separation, as you can see in the data. If you look at uh, inequality in household incomes, uh, you can see a widening of inequality in census data. The poorest 20% of the population have seen their incomes fall as a fraction of total income. Uh, from 4.3% to 3.1% since 1975. Uh, the middle 60 has seen their income, the middle 60%, so what you might call the middle class, has seen their share of income fall from 52% to 45%. Uh, 
the top 20% has seen their incomes rise from 43% of the pie to 52%. And the top 5% has done extraordinarily well. And if you looked at the data in finer increments, po top 1%, top 0.1, top, top 0.001, you would find extraordinary uh, wealth in e uh, income inequality at the very high end as well. A lot of the divisions in income are uh, due to um, a, a premium to education. So college educated uh, workers have done pretty well. Wages have risen by 22%, shown in red here, uh, over since 1975. Wage income in general has sort of stagnated, but for college educated people, wage, wages have, have continued to rise. Whereas wages for high school graduates have a are actually lower now, adjusting for inflation, than they were in 1975. Um, pretty astonishing data. Uh, co coincident with this problem of income inequality is a real decline in economic mobility. The United States has always prided itself on being the place where you can get ahead, where you can, where you know anybody can become president, and so on. Um, but, but, but mobility has declined pretty dramatically in the last 50 years, to the point where uh, we are now a less mobile country than a lot of countries, uh, you know, just a little bit less economically, or a little bit more economically mobile than the United Kingdom, but less economically mobile than countries like France, Japan, Germany, and so on. So, and this is known as sort of the Great, the great Gatsby phenomenon, that with uh, income inequality comes uh, lack of social mobility, lack of economic mobility. So this is a real problem. Um, and here's what I think is the starkest manifestation, the, sort of the gut punch manifestation of this. And I don't know if you can see the numbers there. This is uh, mortality rates for people 45 to 54. This is uh, from a paper by Ann Case and Angus Deaton uh, from 2015, I think. Um, and uh, you can see, so these are mortality rates by country for people ages 45 to 54. Every country around the world has seen declining mortality rates, as you would expect with countries that are growing in income and so on. That red line is white Americans between the ages of 45 and 54. And the fact that white Americans have seen such a, uh, ha have seen a real reversal in, mortal in the decline in mortality since 2000 is just astonishing to me. And if you go through the paper and look at the, at the breakdowns, this is primarily people who lack a college education. Um, and it is, I'm sure, the, the paper for some reason focuses on white Americans, but I'm sure that the same phenomenon uh, occurs for non-white Americans as well. It's a working class uh, uh, peop uh, phenomenon, people with, la with no college education that are really suffering. And the causes of mortality are we're killing ourselves. Suicide, alcoholism, drugs. And so I think there is a sort of social collapse uh, in some segments of, of, uh, of America. Um, all right, so there's a paper by, uh, or a book by um, Peter Temin, an uh, economic historian in 2017, where he tries to make sense of this sort of separation of America into two economies. And he goes back to some work in development economics from the 1950s. Um, which uh, describes developing economies um, in terms of a dual economy framework where you have one sort of technologically advanced sector and, uh, with high living standards and, and dyna dynamic growth and one that is sort of stagnant and traditional and low income. Um, and so he describes the American economy in these terms as we are looking more and more like the kind of developed economies that people have written about, um, starting with Arthur Lewis in the, in the 1950s. Um, I would add to that uh, a concept that I learned as an undergraduate, um, uh, from also from development economics, which is, which is related to this, which is the concept of articulated and disarticulated economy. Um, what uh, the, the concept of articulated and disarticulated economies, to me, kind of explains the political angle, the policy, the, the how policy is developed in a, in a dual economy. Um, an articulated economy, uh, I have sort of cutesy little uh, uh, qu quotations, passages, and pictures here. Uh, the dual, the, the art, an articulated economy is kind of epitomized by Henry Ford's decision in 1914 to raise 
workers' pay at his factories to $5 a day. And somebody asked him, why did you do this? And he said, because I want my workers to be able to afford my product. And so the, uh, now I think that was a, a lie, a subterfuge, it was PR. Uh, but uh, but it, it, it sort of uh, epitomizes what an articulated e economy is. An articulated economy is where the workers that are making the products are also the customers uh, that uh, buy the products. And so uh, that kind of economic system, in that kind of economic system, there is a, an incentive for policymakers who are responding to the issue, to the interest of the business community and all walks of, people of all walks of life, to build policies that support the middle class, that, that are sort of high wage policies um, where the, the workers can actually buy the products that are being produced. A disarticulated economy is uh, represented in the, the movie It's a Wonderful Life where um, uh, George Bailey makes this impassioned plea to Mr. Potter saying that, um, uh, that these people that, he's, that are, he's trying to foreclose on, these people, uh, he's calling them rabble. He says, no, these aren't rabble. These are the people who bank at your bank and they, they are customers in your stores. Uh, doesn't that make them good citizens? And Potter res you know, responds, no, I'm not, I don't care about them. Uh, they're not my children, foreclose on them. Um, and so that's a disarticulated economy where the people who are doing the work are, in their function in the economy is a pure cost. The, and, and what I think, the way that describes the economy today, and I'm just, this is my provocative point that I'm putting out there, is that we have an economy where the top 20% or so, or the, maybe the top 40% of the population, account for the vast bulk of purchases so that is the source of demand for products. That is the source of dynamism in the economy. That is, and, and the system requires, or the system uh, uh, operates on the basis of businesses pushing products to that system. That is the market, to that segment of the population. Whereas the lower income classes uh, are a pure cost as far as the system is concerned. That, that the, the bottom 20%, the bottom 40%, even the bottom 60% maybe, is not the main market for, uh, for the bulk of goods and services produced in the US. And so the, the system sort of gravitates towards policies that push wages down in order to reduce costs and in order to, uh, to, to sort of benefit more the, or the, the purposes of the system, which is to keep demand up in the, uh, and, and markets up in the, at the top end of the system. And so this is a, a vision of the economy that's very similar to the way development economists have, uh, have looked at, um, at disarticulated economies in the third world. Uh, I would say, so relating this to the Trump phenomenon, I think what this, what this means is that we've had several decades now of policies that have failed to serve the interests of the working class, um, and in fact, probably the bulk of Americans. And instead, the policy debates under Democrats and, and Republicans alike have been focused on policies that are conducive to, or at least not in stark contradiction to, the interests of business uh, selling to the upper income strata. Um, and so things like uh, representation of workers in unions uh, loses support in our system. Things like affordable college education, things like affordable health care. <coughs> These things that really matter to the lives of the bottom 80% uh, sort of lose their cachet and instead policies are aimed more towards the interest of con sustaining this system um, where, the, uh, where the market is the top 20% or so of the population. How much time do I have? Overtime? You went over time. Okay, so, uh, so just wrap up that, that I think this, this sort of um, is the economic foundation or the fundamental economic problem that caused candidates, uh, that caused voters in 2016 to gravitate towards anti-establishment or anti-system candidates. I mean, it's, it's no surprise or it should be no surprise that people look for the anti-system candidate when the system in this analysis is sort of, uh, uh, is operating against their interests, is treating them as a cost rather than the purpose of policy. Um, I guess that's all I've got to say about that. I, I, I think I, I can't, uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk later in the question and answer about what types of policies might resolve this. 
Um, I think that there was some hope at the be hope there in a, in a parallel universe, I think, at the beginning of the Trump administration, you could have seen Donald Trump cobbling together policies that supported the middle class. That was part of his rhetoric, was preserving the social safety net and preserving jobs and creating jobs through infrastructure programs. And you could see the possibility there. And I think what he did was he sort of turned in a different direction uh, in the actual uh, implementation of policy. And so I get the sense that in 2020, we're going to relitigate the 2016 election. It's the same fundamental economic anxiety that's going to drive things. And so I don't know what the policies are that will, you know, uh, uh, change this system in a fundamental way, but I think, um, I would say just my parting uh, statement would be that we will know that America is great again when it's easier to make a fortune selling middle class housing to uh, people in Queens than it is uh, uh, selling uh, luxury apartments to the super rich in Manhattan. Jennifer Gaffney, I'm a, a philosopher, a professor in the philosophy department, um, uh, and because I'm a philosopher, I will offer no data to support my claims like Char did, um, uh, no evidence, uh, but I would like to um, offer a framework that I think might be helpful for understanding the current political climate, um, and especially uh, what it means to be a citizen in that climate. Um, and some of what I have to say is going to dovetail with what Char said, um, but it will be philosophical. Um, uh, and so I'm going to turn principally to the philosopher Hannah Arendt. Um, uh, and just so you guys know, I, I'm going to read my paper because um, I don't trust myself to, to do this well otherwise. So, okay. Never before have we been so interconnected, so accessible to one another. The global networks of technology and commerce that order our daily lives have made even the furthest corners of the earth reachable in a single Skype call. Never before have we been able so vigilantly to keep track of one another, to communicate so quickly our ideas and opinions, and to share so publicly the details of our private lives. And yet, while these things no doubt mark our age as one of hyperbolic interconnectedness, I would like to suggest that we nevertheless find ourselves more alienated and hidden from one another than ever before. This paradoxical alienation, that we are so extremely together and so extremely apart, uh, is perhaps no more apparent than in political life today. Citizens in liberal and allegedly open societies struggle not just to converse, but even more than this, to see themselves as belonging to the same reality. While we have greater access to each other and to the events of the world than ever before, we use this access to build echo chambers rather than spaces for genuine discourse, and find that we can barely recognize the humanity of those who threaten our own worldviews. The 20th century political philosopher Hannah Arendt provides a helpful resource for interpreting this paradoxical alienation. She does this through her analysis of what she describes as the loneliness of liberal citizens and the vulnerability that she believes this loneliness creates to dangerous forms of political organization. Though Arendt develops her concerns in relation to the rise of European totalitarianism at the beginning of the 20th century, I wish to suggest that her insights provide an important platform for considering the loneliness of citizens in Western liberal democracies today, and the extent to which this might help us understand the increasing vulnerability of these societies to right-wing populism. Uh, so now I'm just going to talk a, a little bit about what Arendt thinks the political is. We usually associate totalitarianism with a form of government, often fascism and sometimes communism. We then treat liberalism as the other of totalitarianism. Arendt, for her part, thinks differently about this, treating totalitarianism as the closure of the political sphere, a closure that is possible in any society, including our own liberal democratic society. For Arendt, this closure is no minor matter. She attributes extraordinary significance to the political sphere, conceiving of it not in terms of government bureaucracy, as we often do, but instead as what she calls a space of appearance, or that space in which we become visible to one another in our humanity. In contrast to the sphere of labor, which is governed by the cyclical processes of production and consumption, and work, which is governed by the yardsticks and measurements of utility, 
Arendt argues that the political is where we go to speak and act with others in order to introduce new meaning to the world, intervening in the necessity that governs ordinary, li ordinary life. In other words, it is the space for the appearance of human freedom. Only here are we able to appear not as dispensable and interchangeable entities, but as radically unique and capable of acting against the overwhelming odds of statistical law and probability. Only in this space, Arendt argues, do the reductive metrics of utility lose their relevance, disclosing a more authentic possibility for human life, one that enables a common world constituted by the irreducible singularity and plurality of its actors to appear. And yet, Arendt argues that the very structures that organize liberal democracy today have led to the loss of this space. She attributes this loss to the emphasis in the liberal political tradition on the expansion of rights and liberties in the private sphere and the elevation of the security of these rights to the paramount aim of politics. Though Arendt takes it to be a pillar of all civilized government to protect the private rights and liberties of individual citizens, she suggests that today this has been transformed into the sole concern of politics enabling the necessity that drives the pursuit of enlightened self-interest and the national investment in the expansion of these interests to rule supreme. In consequence of this, she argues that the principle of unending accumulation of wealth has replaced the body politic, and the body politic has dissolved into the sum total of private interests. With this, citizenship is taken to be an indefinitely expandable legal status, promising liberty in exchange for obedience to the law. And guaranteeing the right to pursue one's private interests as far as possible, so long as this does not preclude others from doing the same, the liberal traditions purports to, uh, to have found in the social contract a foundation for just society. Yet Arendt argues that in fact this notion of citizenship separates human beings from their political existence, and in so doing isolates and atomizes them. In view of this, Arendt argues that the liberal credo, that freedom begins where politics ends, has had a devastating effect. It has destroyed the space of appearance, leaving behind lonely citizens who, though pressed together into a great mass, nevertheless remain hidden, unable to appear to one another as anything more than superfluous and dispensable. Okay, so now I'd just like to talk a little bit about how she thinks of this problem of loneliness in relation to that idea. In her seminal 1951 work, The Origins of Totalitarianism, Arendt says, quote, what prepares men for totalitarian domination in the non-totalitarian world is the fact that loneliness, once a borderline experience, has become the everyday experience of the ever-growing masses of our century. Loneliness, she says, arises when human beings discover that they no longer belong to a world with others who can bring the fullness of their humanity into relief. A symptom of what she describes as worldlessness or world alienation Loneliness sets in when human beings have been deprived of their political existence and severed from the meaningful nexus of relations that, constitu that constitute the common world. In view of this, she says, quote, world alienation and not self-alienation, as Marx suggested, is the hallmark of the modern age. Arendt argues that we witnessed the breaking point of this experience at the beginning of the 1930s in Germany, uh, when the otherwise politically indifferent masses, who had been taken by the political leaders to be, quote, no more than the inarticulate backward setting of the nation decided to organize. These masses, she says, quote, had nothing in common except their vague apprehension that all the powers that be were not so much evil as they were equally stupid and fraudulent. This negative solidarity fueled what was to come. Yet Arendt argues that this was only possible insofar as the masses had already become lonely. In contrast to solitude and even isolation, Arendt describes loneliness as the anxiety one has over the loss of self that occurs upon being severed from a common world that can confirm the truth of one's experience. This anxiety causes individuals to lose trust in who they are and the elementary confidence in the world which is necessary to make experiences at all. Quote, self and world, the capacity for thought and experience are lost at the same time. Upon falling into despair over this loss of self in the surrounding world, Human beings become disoriented. Loneliness overwhelms us with doubt and uncertainty regarding the truth of our experience, leaving us without a tangible reality in which to ground ourselves. For this reason, she explains, the feeling of loneliness is, quote, among the most desperate and radical experiences of man. It is precisely this desperation, Arendt argues, that, uh, that makes human beings willing to surrender their humanity to the delusional fellowship promised by totalitarianism. How am I on top? I'm okay, right? Okay. Because we're getting to the good stuff, like, right now. You're doing great. Uh, 
Whereas totalitarian movements like National Socialism are often thought to arise because of the sense of community they promise, Arendt maintains that this notion of community is delusional. What appeals is not a real possibility for belonging, but rather the stringent logicality that drives totalitarian ideology. She explains that it is only possible to appease the despair of loneliness by remaining consistent in one's reasoning, which provides, quote, the only reliable truth human beings can fall back upon once they have lost the mutual guarantee, the common sense men need in order to experience and live and know their way in a common world. Totalitarian ideology distinguishes itself from other ideologies insofar it is, as it is driven not by an idea, such as class consciousness or even racism, but by the coercive force of the logical process itself. Upon accepting the first premise of the movement's ideology, lonely individuals must follow through with the deduction it prescribes or else risk rendering their lives meaningless. In view of this, Arendt says, totalitarianism is nothing more than organized loneliness. It weaponizes the lonely masses who have become desperate enough to surrender their inner freedom of thought to the sheer force of logic that drives totalitarian terror. What then does this have to do with us today? To be sure, our era is decidedly different from the one Arendt is describing. And, and I would argue, and I, I will say more about this if you want in the, the Q&A, but I don't think uh, a new Hitler has come to power, and I think that there are some real differences between what was going on in Nazi Germany and, and European totalitarianism in general and the political climate today. Even so, Arendt's insight should prompt us to reflect on the loneliness that may remain at work in our own society today. We find ourselves living in a post-truth era in which fake news and alternative facts are referred to regularly to express suspicion over the reliability, not just of the words and deeds of others, but of the reality of the world itself. We use terms like the hidden Trump supporter to describe vast swaths of the American electorate, and we tend to turn to the echo chambers of Twitter and Facebook rather than the public square to advance our political views. Far-right movements are becoming increasingly mainstream, galvanizing support across classes and political interest groups who have nothing in common except for a shared frustration with the powers that be. These movements are finding their greatest appeal in nations that purport to be the most liberal, democratic, and progressive on earth, pointing to the need for critical engagement with the ways in which these political structures might produce and perpetuate the very loneliness that is making liberal citizens vulnerable to populist politics today. Uh, in view of this, what seems to be called for is a rehabilitation and cultivation of the public sphere, or a politics that Arendt might describe as a politics of appearance that draws lonely citizens out of their hiding and into the full illumination of the public realm. We might think of citizenship not as an indefinitely expandable legal status, but rather as a responsibility to make one another visible in the public realm. While this would no doubt uh, work against the loneliness of modern life, Arendt reminds us that it requires of us that we have the courage to, bef to appear before our political opponents, to speak and act with them in order to take shared responsibility for the world we have inherited. In other words, as Arendt says, quote, it requires courage to leave the protective security of our four walls and enter into the public realm. Courage liberates men from their worry about their individual lives and the interests connected with them for the freedom of the world. Courage is indispensable because in politics, not life, but the world is at stake. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce specifically told me not to introduce people between the speakers. Oh, well, no. this is my but let me say, that was Jennifer Gaffney, who is really wonderful. <laughs> I don't know who this is. This, by the way, is my only slide. <laughs> Unlike some of you were in my last talk, and I had some data up. I have no data this time, which makes me in Jen's camp. I also have no theory, which puts me out of all of their camp. <laughs> and somehow, using law, and in particular, the kind of law I'm going to read to, um, uh, where the court regulates elections, I'm going to try to tie together Star and Jen's paper a little bit. And I do this um, with great trepidation because our new president is in fact a lawyer and I am very much out of my lane on this. So I'm sure he will let me know. Thank you, Bob, if you do. Right even in the middle of the talk if you want. <laughs> so let me say that Jen and, Jen and uh, Char brought in some important theorists. In a way, I am going to discuss some political theorists too, although my theorists sit in the space where 
I would say the theoretical rubber meets the road. Uh, in particular, I want to discuss theories of democracy uh, and therefore of citizenship, right, implicit in some of the Supreme Court's decisions in the area of elections. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the court's rulings in campaign finance regulation, uh, in part because that's about the only thing I know, um, but also because of the normative theory of democracy and citizenship that are implicit in these rulings, but we don't often think about them that way. And I'm going to argue, and really very tentatively, like incredibly tentatively, see I'm setting up the boundaries <laughs> for failure already. <laughs> That th this is what we do as professors, <laughs> that the highly regulated uh, system of campaign finance in the United States, a system that allows significant freedom for individuals and groups to use market resources to influence political outcomes, is at least partly complicit in the rise of populists like Donald Trump. I'm not arguing that elected officials like Trump can win because they can spend a lot of money or because they've outspent their opponents. In fact, um, Clinton cons outspent Trump considerably in the 2016 election. And she also raised more money from Wall Street financial interests than did Trump. Instead, what I want to argue is that the, that the free flow of money in the U.S. campaigns has fueled the kind of financial and economic conditions that Charis talked about, but also that create real problems in developing a kind of robust citizenship that Jen talked about. There's my thumb, see, got that? <laughs> see if I can actually come through with this. So we often think, uh, rightly enough, of democratic processes as creating public officials, laws, policies, and so on. But democratic processes are themselves constructed by laws, right? And so the kind of democracy that we have is very much shaped by law and by the court interpreting those laws. When the court interprets election laws, their interpretation rests on some theory of democracy, even if only implicitly. And the court proceeds often as if its decisions are merely adhering to something akin to the true nature of democracy, when in fact there are many alternative versions of democracy that it could rely on, but it doesn't. Many commentators, including Char and Jen, have made note of the economization, I got it right that time, of political life with the ultimate aim of capital enhancement. I would argue that in its campaign finance ruling, the court has at a minimum aided and abetted this process, opting for a theory of democracy that equates donors and citizens and sees spaces as a public lawmaking and deliberation such as Congress as in need of no special protections from huge financial and economic interests able to co-opt those spaces for their own benefit. So in the court's version of democracy, and I'll get into some detail, there are no protective walls around the spaces of lawmaking and deliberation that would serve to elevate citizen voices relative to private interests that are, as we see from Char's presentation, pounding away at them every day in the private sphere. It's a kind of version of democracy that eliminates one of the few spaces that a f where a fair fight could be had. Uh, and where a kind of robust citizenship might percolate up and articulate a common vision based on a wider array of voices than is currently represented. So let me go into a little bit of detail here. So the court's rulings on campaign finance start with a theory or maybe even a metaphor of democracy as a free market of ideas. The currency in this market is speech, and the court has long viewed with hostility any efforts to regulate or to constrain it. The First Amendment, it claims, was designed to secure the widest possible dissemination of information from diverse and antagonistic sources. The problem, of course, is that it costs money to disseminate information. And this is especially true in campaigns, right? Whereas election laws, where election law scholar Tim uh, Kuhner points out, society's most, to use the terms again, diverse and antagonistic interests are likely to be found on opposite ends of the economic hierarchy with significant inequalities of resources available to each for disseminating speech, right? So in this regard, the court's free market of ideas metaphor departs significantly 
from, uh, say, political theorist John Rawls's um, uh, equal value of liberties pr principle, where the value of one's right to disseminate information is significantly diminished if the opposing side has vast resources to drown it out. Since the court views speech as an unqualified good, it also sees the expenditure of campaign money for disseminating speech, really the purchase of an audience, as enjoying the same constitutional protections of the speech itself. The court made this argument in its landmark case of Buckley versus Vallejo, Vallejo in 1976, when it invalidated significant portions of major campaign finance reform legislation passed by Congress in 1974. And the principle that money equals speech continues to govern the court's campaign finance jurisdiction, jurisprudence to the current day. As an aside, it's worth noting here that Justice Lewis Powell, who uh, signed on to the per curiam majority opinion in the Buckley case, I assume, had five years earlier authored a memo for the U.S. Chamber of Congress titled Attack on the Free American Free Enterprise System, urging business interests to organize against the increasing regulatory activism of individuals uh, such as consumer advocate Ralph Nader. So, so equating campaign money with speech rather than, say, property. It was also an important move by the court because it triggers First Amendment concerns. The court always balances rights against the government's interest in regulating. In cases not involving fundamental rights, it uses a kind of ordinary level of review which generally gives the government the benefit of the doubt. Regulation needs to be rationally related to some legitimate government interest. That's all. When a fundamental right like speech is at stake, the court uses a more exacting level of scrutiny, called strict scrutiny, to determine if the government has a legitimate interest here. Under strict scrutiny, regulation must be quote unquote narrowly tailored to achieve a quote unquote compelling government interest. As constitutional law scholar Richard Hasten notes, strict, strict scrutiny is like the government putting a big thumb on the scale favoring challengers of the law. One can imagine a lot, many compelling government interests in regulating campaign spending, right? I'm gonna list a few. One would think the government has a compelling interest in protecting the integrity of the election process. In fact, the court ex accepted such an interest in upholding the Federal Corrupt Practices Act in 1925. One could plausibly argue that the government has a compelling interest in limiting the distorting effect of vast aggregations of wealth or in preventing the most affluent from monopolizing election discourse as an interest, in fact, that the Canadian Supreme Court does accept in regulating campaign, or in upholding regulations on campaign finance. And given the value of equality in democracies, one could conceivably argue that the government has a compelling interest in leveling the political playing field. Such an approach would balance liberty and equality concerns rather, emphasizing, rather than emphasizing only the former. In fact, the court refused to recognize any of these compelling government interests. Instead, the majority in Buckley, and, and well, let me step back for a second, what it was particularly harsh about was the leveling the playing field interest. Um, the government, in the, in the court's per curiam op opinion, uh, the court decision read that, quote, the concept that government may restrict the speech of some elements in our society in order to enhance the relative voice of others is wholly foreign to the First Amendment. As it turns out, the only compelling government interest the court would recognize is preventing the corruption, is preventing corruption or the appearance thereof. And according to the court, there is only corruption when it is quid pro quo corruption, and that is an arrangement set up prior, beforehand. So if an elected official is responsive only to his or her most generous donors, that is not corruption, according to the court. Here's Chief Justice Roberts writing for the majority in McCutcheon versus Federal Election Commission, a 2014 case. Quote, ingratiation and access are not corruption. They embody a central feature of democracy. This is astounding, really. Right? Ingrati I'm going to read that again. Ingratiation and access are not corruption. They embody a central feature of democracy. Their constituents 
you should read constituents as donors, because that's what he means, that constituents support candidates who share their beliefs and interests, and candidates who are elected can be expected to be responsive to those concerns. Justice Kennedy in, in Citizens United, it is well understood that a substantial and legitimate reason, if not the only reason, to cast a vote for or to make a contribution to one candidate over another is that the candidate will respond by producing those political outcomes the supporter favors. Democracy is premised on such responsiveness. So in the court's view, then, not only is responsiveness to, to donors not corrupt, it is normatively desirable. It's how democracy should work, with donors holding just as much sway over office holders as ordinary citizens. The court's extraordinarily cramped and narrow definition is, of corruption is key because it makes it nearly impossible for any campaign finance restrictions to withstand constitutional scrutiny. So for example, a candidate since a candidate cannot corrupt him or herself, the court has invalidated limits on what candidates may spend on their own campaigns, either from their own personal fortune or money they raise from others. Uh, my member of Congress right now on his last campaign spent $19 million of his own money, perfectly legal, perfectly constitutional. Similarly, independent spending whereby a group, including corporations, spends money attacking or supporting a candidate but not in coordination with the candidate cannot by definition meet the court's narrow definition of corruption because that definition requires coordination. Independent expenditures, quote unquote, do not lead to the or create the appearance of quid pro corruption, asserted Justice Kennedy in the Citizens United decision without any empirical evidence. And the result of that decision, it is worth noting, has been predictable, an onslaught of independent campaign spe spending, much of it by financial interest in federal elections. Uh, since the case was decided, that's actually a look at the increase in independent <coughs> expenditures that have happened since 2010. That's my only data. <laughs> the bigger point here is distilled by, again, by law professor Tim Gunner. Despite the fact that the Constitution says nothing about how elections ought to be paid for, writes Gunner, the Supreme Court has championed the idea that money is speech, democracy is a free market, Corporations have the same rights to outside expenditures as citizens. It's unconstitutional to limit spending in the name of political equality. Heightened political access to wealthy donors does not translate into corruption, and public financing systems are unconstitutional if they reduce the effectiveness of private political spending. The court has made up these principles all from scratch. No precedent. This is how it reasons in these cases. I think this touches on things that you all were talking about. I think, uh, first of all, a torrent of campaign money has almost assuredly helped to fuel the economic trends that Char has talked about. In 2017, and I don't mean to be partisan here because I don't doubt Democrats would do the same thing, when Republicans were fighting over the size of the tax cut, a group of several GOP billionaire donors connected to the Koch brothers network openly said they'd withhold their ca campaign contributions until the party produced legislation they wanted. Not long after, the donors issued their threat, the GOP passed a massive tax cut. Commentators this week were suggesting that the tax policies uh, with upwardly skewed benefits such as this one is one of the reasons why in the American Community uh, Survey data released uh, by the Census Bureau earlier this week, the income gap was wider at any time in America since the Census Bureau began computing this in 1966. The price of elections also makes it exceedingly difficult for Democrats to win elections rely without relying uh, on money from the financial se sector. And this dependence, in turn, limits the kind of policy programs the party can put on its agenda. Do I have left? Not much, OK. <laughs> I will say two more points on this. It seems entirely plausible to me that policies fueled by excessive campaign funding help widen the income gap, and it is also incontestable that the income gap undercuts citizen political participa participation and civic engagement. There is clear and durable evidence that such participation, whether it's voting, writing a letter to one's legislative representative, attending a local town meeting, is positively associated with, with wealth. So more poor people, in short, means less participation, less civ civic engagement. Last thing I'll say. Uh, 
I've got you maybe believing this story. Uh, I'm going to plant a big seed of doubt now. Because that's what we should do as social scientists, right? We shouldn't just believe this argument or this narrative that I've laid out, although it does seem pretty tight and convincing, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> I'm going to plant a seed of doubt, right? And, uh, you know, we ought to be skeptical about claims like I'm making, and there are a few holes in mine. First of all, there has been a significant rise in a kind of populist politics in Europe, and there is a wide variety of different campaign finance systems there. Indeed, many nations have more restrictive campaign finance systems than the U.S., uh, and many have public funding, right? And so we are seeing different campaign finance systems producing the same kinds of um, populism, which has become widespread in Europe now. And what's more, if you look at data in uh, 2016, and this actually undercuts all of your thesis as well, <laughs> okay? And this is really important. Data on 2016 shows that Voter racial resentment, these are kind of underlying attitudes of racial resentment, were more highly correlated with the Trump vote than were voter economic or financial anxiety, right? And so we're, how much is about this is the economy? How much of it is about race, immigration, and so on? In any event, so any claims like the one I'm making, right, that I am very willing to believe because of who I am and because of what I've trained myself to believe, but as an academic, we ought, to, we ought to contest those views most strongly when we believe them, right? Any claims that our country loose campaign finance laws has helped fuels, fuel the rise of populist politics needs to be squared with these other empirical realities that it doesn't really explain very well. That's all I got. We can talk some more about it. Well, thank you to all three of our panelists. I had planned to sort of wrap up with my um, own model for the rise of populism using topological group theory and complex dynamics. <laughs> but looking at the clock, I'm not sure we have time for that. So instead, maybe we should open the floor for any questions we have for our three panelists. Yes. Has, uh, correctly hit the nail on the head. Uh, every part of my life, I'm a lawyer uh, by training, every part of my life has been affected by the buck. Uh, I was able to go to college. I was not that good a student, but I had didn't need a scholarship. I was able to go to law school. I didn't need a scholarship. I, uh, every client who came into my office uh, when I did uh, the first question, which senior uh, lawyers would say to me is, did you mention money? You have to mention money. Uh, and then the Constitution, and we go to the Supreme Court. One of the jokes uh, the uh, criminal lawyers used to tell me is, after the OJ case, uh, they said everybody wanted the same defense as O.J. got. Uh, can I give you $500 to start, and uh, uh, I'll pay it over time, you know? I said, um, no, the uh, public defender's office is right down the corner. You know? So uh, uh, I support liberals. Uh, I expect them to bring in the bacon on the liberal uh, uh, causes. I don't give my money to the uh, American Friends Service Committee to say, but then again, there may be good wars. Uh, no, no, you got paid to keep us out of war. You know? And I think every politician is on the take, uh, both Democrats and Republicans. Yeah, uh, as as a, a person said to me once, why does a job that pays 100, why would you spend $19 million for a job that pays $150,000? I said, well, they want to help America or something. So uh, the bottom line is the cash, the scratch, the, uh, the guilt. And uh, I have to agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. We have another question over here. I'm an historian. And so my question for the three of you is, I loved your slide that you had, your first slide, not your data slide. <laughs> That's a great slide. Uh, I just wanted to put that out there. Now 
And, and the reason why I liked it was because t in my mind, and I just wanted your reactions, all three of you, your reactions, it seems to me we're now entering uh, a new Gilded Age. Mark Twain once said, history didn't repeat itself, but it kind of rhymes, okay? So th this is what it was in the 1880s and 90s, and it's kind of like what it is right now. Reactions to you guys, from you guys, sorry. I'm gonna say just one thing on that, and then I'm gonna turn it over. I'm gonna read a part of something that I couldn't read because I got cut off. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's actually really interesting. No, no thank you, no, thank you. That I'm glad we talked beforehand about that. Uh, does it have anything to do with his comments, yeah. or is it just... No, it does, actually. actually. It does, actually. Uh, so this guy, I like, Tim, Tim Kuhn, who's a law professor, I think it maybe at Stanford or something, calls right now the, 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 the third era of plutocracy that we are entering, with, with the first being the era of slavery, and the second being the rise of huge corporate trusts in the early 20th century. And, and all of these kind of had something in common, right? Is they produced massive concentrations of wealth, right? That then are used in the political marketplace to perpetuate that. His, his, diff his argument is that the only difference between the current and, and the current era of plutocracy is that it's more global. It's more global. And that, you know, plutocrats now have more in, from all over the world have more in common with each other than they do with their fellow country people. So I think, you know, it's, I mean, if you look at the uh, income inequality. Yeah, I'll just so uh, add to that. Um, the, I think Bruce mentioned that the uh, American Community Survey measures of income inequality show that we are more unequal since the uh, census started to uh, uh, measure this in the 1960s. But there's a group of economists, um, uh, now I can't remember their names, Saez, Piketty, uh, Pic yeah, right, uh, Piketty wrote the book, but uh, Emmanuel Saez has done this in incredible work of, uh, there's actually a, a, a database out there, uh, World Top Incomes Database, uh, I, th I think that's what it's called, and it may have, been, may have changed hands, but he goes back using tax records to look at income inequality in the 1920s to today, um, especially focusing on the top 1% or the top 1 one-hundredth of 1%. And it's amazing how much income inequality has risen. Uh, there was a dramatic reduction in, in income inequality, a reduction in the, in the in share of income going to the top sliver of the population in the United States between the Great Depression, from the Great Depression afterwards into the 1960s or so. And then a dramatic U-turn to the point where uh, that segment of the population has a share of income that's just as high as it was at the end of the 1920s before the Great Depression. And I'm not saying that this means that we're going to have a Great Depression. We, we already had that in 2007, um, 2008. Uh, no, but, but this is a, you know, sort of stark evidence of, the, of a return to a um, plutocratic system. And I, and, I, and I do agree that this is a global system in, in these sort of super cities like New York or Vancouver and places like that. It's the global elite um, that drives up real estate prices and so on. It's just, it's, it's just stark that uh, there's a global elite that's much more mobile now and not much more connected probably than they were back then. Oh, I have to read it. Um, <laughs> so, because I'm not... Uh, so, so I don't know if I can say anything nearly as intelligent about this matter as these guys can, but... Um, uh, so... So it sounds like what they're saying is right, and it seems like something uh, worth worrying about. The only thing I am worried about in these responses is that um, it might be a little bit overly simplistic to reduce the populist response to this, uh, to reduce uh, that only to a class issue, um, uh, especially because um, it seems like it, it's a little bit strange that uh, the 1% is voting together with you know, the people working in, you know, the steel, you know, the, the factories. So, like, so there seems to be more of an alignment uh, with uh, people who have very different class interests. Uh, their, their political alignment, I think, is something that maybe doesn't call this into question, but it's something we should puzzle over because it doesn't quite follow yeah, no, this really model. Interesting. So. 
we, we talk about the people, we talk about populism today, and I think it's just a, a gross misuse of the term. The populists of the late 1890s did respond to your, you know, to the car kind of cartoon that you've got up there. They were genuinely lower middle class people who were, uh, the concern for them was both uh, plutocracy and the unfairness of the system and the corruption of American politics, which spurs the, uh, the uh, progressive movement of the early 19th century. I think that's a totally different dynamic today. And we're calling it populist, but I think it's just a, a, a fraud to use that, that phrase. You know, if I could just respond to that, though, I think, I think there's actually, you know, the, the, these sort of reformers at the beginning of the 20th century, I think they could be divided into populists and progressives, and they had different, different sort of agendas but overlapping agendas. But the progressives still suffer from Sure, sure. Sure, absolutely. There's a guy, Bruce Kane, who's written about this, so the kind of separation between the, where, how their agendas differed and, and so on. And so a lot of progressives, for example, wanted sort of rule by expertise, by bureaucrat. And, but populists were behind initiatives and referendums and, and things like that. So there was some cross pressure there. I would add, too, that I think your comment is really interesting, Jen. And then one of the things that the system that I'm talking about, uh, it doesn't have any room for any kind of robust citizenship of the kind that you were talking, right? Like, it, it basically, it reduces citizens to hearers and consumers of sort of big money politics. And so there's no, there's, there's so, there's no sort of robust sense of citizenship that this kind of, it doesn't, necessarily preclude it, legally or otherwise, but it certainly doesn't incentivize it or do anything to nurture or cultivate it. And I think that's, you know, we ju we're just hearers of the rhetoric being spewed from the top now that are always trying to make this about an us versus them thing. You know what I mean? I mean, Trump did, if Trump did nothing else, what he did was try to convince people, lower income people, who, who were economically anxious that he had their interests in mind. Right, that's the, that's you know? yeah. so puzzling about the right, situation. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, and I think w that where, um, where, where race comes in, or race uh, and, and immigration and that kind of issue, is that I think that people respond to that appeal when they are economically anxious. So I think it's going to be really hard, I think it would be hard statistically to tease out the, the difference between response to, ang to economic anxiety and the response to immigration and race and so on. And let me just, I'll just add that I think the sort of the uh, underrated player in the sort of the, the Trump, Trump's appeal to, uh, to voters is uh, gender. That, um, that his, he's clearly articulating a um, sort of traditional gender role uh, uh, approach that I think really resonates, and, and even to the point of sort of the advocacy of steel and coal, um, you know, the, the, the promotion of that kind of vision for the economy, I think is very gendered. And I'm not at all an expert in gender, uh, gender uh, studies and things like that, but I think it's, it's clear that gender has a really important role, maybe as important as, as race and economics. I think we have time for one last quick question, if there is one. Um, I thought you guys did a really great job explaining sort of the foundation that allowed Trump to come to power. Um, but I was curious, a lot, um, one of the largest groups of people that ended up voting were those who didn't vote in the 2016 election because they just didn't relate to either candidate. And I was wondering if you guys uh, could give any thoughts that you have about what would have to change in the uh, 2020 election for a candidate to have a wider appeal across parties because uh, at certain points you were saying that some issues are going to play up again and again in this election. So um, what changes do you guys think candidates would have to have to have a wider appeal? Thanks for the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and unfortunately. <laughs> uh, oh, time's up. I'll take no, I had, up. A, I had a thought. <laughs> I had a thought which was, you know, I alluded to the, um, the agenda that Trump could have uh, proposed, could have followed once he became president. That really would have been challenging. I think it would have been, it would have destroyed the Democratic Party and possibly destroyed the transformed the Republican Party. I, I guess that's happened anyway. But, but a, a set of policies 
consistent with his campaign promises um, that spoke to the needs of the working class that was within his grasp. I mean, uh, if he had opened with an infrastructure program, uh, which he promised but uh, has not delivered, he could have gotten his wall if he had proposed a million, a trillion dollar infrastructure program to Congress, to a Democratic, uh, to Democratic uh, members of Congress, they probably would have taken the wall with that. He could have, um, uh, he could have uh, protected, uh, you know, cam campaigned to strengthen uh, Medicare and Social Security. Um, he, he could have uh, had his uh, restrictions on immigration. There was a, I think there was a, a set of policies there that I would not have been comfortable with at all, which uh, sort of, um, which, which speaks to the needs of the working class while also having the same kind of uh, rhetoric, which I would call sort of nativist rhetoric uh, in terms of immigration and so on. It, it would have been a very powerful uh, policy package that I think would have torn the Democrats apart in terms of separating the the uh, sort of working class Democrats from the more uh, socially or, or liberal Democrats or people interested in civil rights and so on. He didn't choose to do that. He chose um, to sort of follow Congress's lead and, uh, and, and produced a set of policies that I think is not very much different from what President Rubio would have done um, with a sort of different style of, of rhetoric. So, uh, so that for, for, for those of us who are Democrats, I mean, that's, I think that's a danger that, that you could have a, a somebody who sort of marries the, speaking to the needs of the, of the working class with the sort of divisive, I would say, racial rhetoric um, and, and, and gender rhetoric. Uh, that's, a that's, that's a possibility. Um, and then I think you have, on the other hand, I think uh, uh, policies like the Green New Deal is the sort of the flip side of the speaking to the um, speaking to the working class, uh, tying together the package of uh, jobs, uh, unions, social welfare programs, tying that to the environment. I think that's, that's, an, that's an alternative. Um, I don't know if we'll get candidates who pursue any, either of those, it, you know, who knows. So I think our other two panelists want to make quick comments. Just really Thanks quick. So um, so I, I think maybe that's the wrong question. Like I think uh, what, what we really probably need to be asking right now is why weren't people voting in 2016? And what do we do, like are there spaces to have conversations about candidates? The candidates who tend to be appealing are the ones that are appealing almost because they're like billboards or advertisements or something. And, and uh, I think probably rather than asking how do we get a candidate to appeal more broadly, we should ask, how do we get people to care about politics and care about why those politics matter for their lives and, and you know, their communities' lives and all of that? So that's it. <laughs> that's great. I don't actually have much more to add to that, other than to say that's the candidate's responsibility. And, you know, you need to show up in places, in communities, and ask people to vote for you. And not, not to be hypercritical of the Clinton campaign, but they sh just didn't show up in Michigan or Wisconsin after the primaries were over, assuming that they had these states uh, locked up, and they didn't, right? And, but behind that is you need to show up in places and, and generate the conversation as a candidate. As a, as a bigger theme, I love the theme of fairness. I think Americans get behind that theme often. I think a candidate who could actually push that theme, fairness. I think most Americans want fairness. And fairness, of course, can be defined in all sorts of different ways, but I think it's a great overarching thing that you need to bring out as a candidate for communities. That's what I would say. Get people excited about, about things that fit into that bigger frame. Thank you, Bruce and Jennifer and Char. <laughs> for a very stimulating hour conversation. Hope everyone has a nice rest of your afternoon.